Hello, everyone. Welcome to Profitable Pastures 2024. Tonight is our last of three webinars uh, for the season. Uh, my name is Birgit Martin. I am the chair of the Ontario Forage Council. Also online this evening are uh, Ontario Forage Council staff, Patricia Ellingwood and Rebecca Vito. And we also have from OMAFRA, Christine O'Reilly and Colin Algie. Um, we'd like to acknowledge our sponsors for the entire Profitable Pastures Conference. Our sponsors are Beef Farmers of Ontario and FARM, which is the Farm Resilience Mentorship Program. Uh, this evening's topic is the best money spent on the ranch. And our guest is Dallas Mount. Dallas Mount is the owner of Ranch Management Consultants, RMC, home of the Ranching for Profit School and Executive Link Program. Dallas has led RMC since 2019 and worked with hundreds of ranchers across the US, Canada and Australia to position their business for economic profit and ecologic health. After working with University of Wyoming Extension for 18 years, Dallas started teaching the Ranching for Profit School in 2012 and quickly established himself as an, elite, as an elite instructor. Dallas and his wife, Dixie, have two adult children and own and manage a grazing operation near Wheatland, Wyoming. RMC is focused on creating profitable businesses with healthy land and happy families. Welcome, Dallas, and I'll turn the floor over to you for the evening. All right. Thank you, Birgit. All right. Well, uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, look through the names on the list there real quick and excited to be with you all tonight. So um, I, I'd love the questions at the end. So please uh, throw the questions in the chat and uh, and we can dive into it. I've What I've got might take about 30 minutes. 30 40 minutes or so to roll through and uh and then we'll hopefully have some have some good discussions so um enjoyed enjoyed thanks for the invitation uh let me tell you guys a little bit about what we do uh ranch management consultants our company and uh the the things that we do because that shapes my perspective on things and, and kind of gives you an idea of, of where we're coming from um so we teach we do two main things we teach the ranching for profit school uh which is a seven day uh, business management school for people in agriculture. It's based on the idea that knowing how to raise crops and livestock is not the same thing as knowing how to run a business that raises crops and livestock. They're they're really two different things. And what we do at Ranching for Profit is, you know, most of our, our clients, people coming to our school are pretty good at raising crops and raising livestock, but often they were never taught how to run a business that does those things. So we we really dive in pretty deep on the business management side of things, looking at economics, finances, um, a lot of people issues, you know, mission and vision, organization structure, uh, cash flow planning, and and all that from the perspective of a farmer ranch. And, and most of our clients are, are livestock producers. So, um, so that's the Ranching for Profit School. Uh, we do about a, a dozen to 14 of those a year. It's been exciting this year. We've added a few in the UK. So, so that's been fun to do. Um, and uh, this last year, over the course of a year, we would have put about six, uh, 600 folks through uh, ranching for profit. So um, it's, a, it's a really fun program to deliver. I'm one of uh, six instructors that teaches ranching for profit. And so we've got a pretty, pretty awesome team. Um, the second thing we do, which is, which is where I'm at now, which is why I'm talking to you from a hotel room, is a program that we call Executive Link. Uh, you'll hear me refer to it as EL for short. So Executive Link, it's based on the idea that when you're self-employed, you work for a lunatic. Um, and the reason is, is that lunatic lets you do uh, whatever you want. And often what we choose to do are the things that we're good at and, and the things that we enjoy, not necessarily the things that actually need to be done in our business. Uh, so in EL, we take graduates of Ranching for Profit and we put them on boards of advisors for each other. And this, this board of advisors will have uh, six businesses on it uh, and they meet three times a year, uh, go through a structured process where they look inside each other's business and hold each other accountable. Uh, so uh, when they meet, they develop an action plan. When they meet again, they they first thing they do is check in on that action plan from the last meeting and say, okay, so what? this is what you said you were gonna do, now what actually happened? So um, so I'm in Oklahoma City right now. We just finished a, a round of executive link meetings uh, with, a, with a really amazing group of ranchers from, from around the country and, and broader. So, um, so those are the, the two main things that we do. So 
a lot of the things I'm going to share with you are things that come out of the Ranching for Profit School, but things that have been refined through our work with uh, farmers and ranchers from across North America um, in Executive Link. So, um, so here, here we go. Um, oh, there's just a snapshot of the of the businesses that uh, attended Ranching for Profit in the last few months. These are just from our schools from November. Each each one of those dots is oftentimes several individuals from a particular farmer ranch. And, and we just did a school in Saskatoon here a couple of weeks ago that hasn't made this uh, this map yet. So we would have a lot more Canadians uh, on the map than, than what's showing up there. But uh, but yeah, that's just kind of, so most of our work is in, is in the central US, um, you know, from, Southern Alberta, Saskatchewan through South Texas. So, um, so that's the the folks we work with. So, let's let's transition to the topic. So, money spent on the farm or ranch. So, the deployment of capital, the deployment of resources, is really a deployment of of profit. And when we make a profit in our businesses, which I which I hope you all want to make, um, you know, if our farms and ranches are not profitable then by definition, they aren't sustainable, right? If we have to keep kicking in outside capital to keep them going, um, at some point they will, they will fail. Um, so hopefully it's a, it's a goal of everyone to, to have a profitable farmer ranch. So when we do have profit, uh, what could we do with that profit? So any business, you know, what, what can that any business do with its profit? Well, here's a, here's a list of things that we came up with, some kind of broad classifications of it. Um, number one is pay down debt, right? So we could use profit to, to, to knock down that debt. Now, obviously we have to meet that minimum debt service obligation that we've agreed to meet our minimum payments, but but we could use more profit to, to, to knock down some of that debt. So that'd be one use of profit. We can talk about if that's good or bad or, or indifferent. Uh, um, another use of profit is to build reserves, right? So, okay, let's put some away, save it for a rainy day, you know, uh, have it have it in reserves when we need it. Another use of profit. Um, another one would be, well, we could go back into the business, right? We all have a list of capital projects or things we'd, we'd like to have done. Um, start a new business. Doesn't have to go back in this business. It could go into a different business, right? Maybe we want to do a real estate business or something else, right? So we could throw that profit that way. Dividends to ownership, right? Now, it, most real businesses do this at some point. Um, a lot of agricultural businesses choose not to do this. Um, there's some good reasons why it should not be done, but maybe there's some reasons why it should be done as well. Uh, and then another use of profit, of course, is to give it away, right? It's to give it away to things that we care about, things that we want to support. So, so there's the main categories of different uses of profit. So when the business generates a profit, what do we want to do with it? Those are all some, some, you know, each of those have good and bad things. And I think I would suggest that most of the businesses we work with that are profitable have some kind of mix of deployment of that profitability. So I always, uh, when, we, when we're working with farms and ranches, what one of the things I encourage them to do is to be thoughtful about what is our profit for before we even start planning for profit. Let's identify when we make a profit, what are we going to use that profit for? And, and when we think through those things, it's often a balanced approach for these different uses of profit. Okay, so, you know, somebody might say, well, we're going to, you know, spend this much on capital projects for the ranch, this much is going to go into reserves, this much is going to be used to service debt, and, and this piece we're going to give it away, right? So I think those are, those are all healthy decisions. But the main point is to have some conversations before profit is made for what is the use of that profit. Hey, okay, well, you know, you might, you guys might be sitting about saying, hey, Dallas, you're talking about agriculture, right? It was, what, what do we always do with profit? On most farms and ranches, what almost always happens with the profit without even a discussion of to where it goes? This is what I would suggest most of those businesses do with it, is almost always, it's always, always piled back into the business in a major way with only the minimum obligation for that service being made. Okay. And I think that's a problem, especially when you realize that most of our farms and ranching, ranching businesses are very, very slim profitability. Um, a lot of them are not profitable, but, but some of them, if they are profitable, it might be like in a one or 2% range, right? And generally they're not good at cash flowing. They're not good at kicking off cash. And so when we put that money back into the business, 
oftentimes what we see is people who are already in a position of lack of economic profitability and lack of cash flow, when they are profitable, they compound that problem. They make it worse. They invest that money into things that don't produce good cash flow and things that are generally not economically profitable. Okay, so what what I want to uh, challenge you guys to do, and and this is you know a lot of livestock markets have been pretty strong, so we've got a lot of clients showing some some pretty dang good profitability numbers. Is when you have those years when you're profitable, let's not make this problem worse, right? If it's if you're feel like you're wealthy on the balance sheet and broke at the bank, a lot of the reason why is that capital allocation. Where are we putting that money when we are profitable? Okay, so so we can give some thoughts to that. So I want to suggest some some various uses of profit, and and one of those we're going to talk about um, that I've been asked to talk about today is is looking at some grazing infrastructure development, and uh, so so we'll get around to that. So so kind of a broader thing is so I w- I want to put some of this money back into the business. So where should we put it? Right. If we're wealthy on the balance sheet and broke at the bank, if the business isn't cash flowing very well then I think this is something to really consider. Are you investing in assets or are you investing in what we might call liabilities? Now, this is a different definition from the classic definition of assets and liabilities, right? If you asked your banker, okay, what what is an asset? They would say, well, it's something that you have. It's something that that is worth something, right? Your car, your house, uh, your ranch, a cow, a machine, all those things would be assets, something that shows up on your balance sheet. And what is a liability? Well, it's something you owe, right? It's the it's the note on the cows, the note on the pickup. Robert Kiyosaki wrote a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and he redefined those terms, assets and liabilities. And I really like his definition. Okay. Um, Kiyosaki, there, there, there's the traditional definition, something of value that we have and the liabilities are something that we owe. Kiyosaki said an asset is something that puts money in your pocket. And a liability is something that takes money out of your pocket. So think about that. Using Kiyosaki's definition, many of our assets are actually liabilities. If something's not creating more cash flow than it's costing, by Kiyosaki's definition, it's a liability. So I want to re-challenge this, de- this deployment of cas- capital, this deployment of profit into your business as let's make sure we're buying assets. Let's make sure we're buying things that produce cash flow, okay? that produce, produce more cash flow than, than what they cost. Now, part of this reason, I think, why farms and ranches tend to buy these things uh, d- d- back into the business, and oftentimes it's very tempting, is this aversion to paying taxes, right? So oftentimes we've been taught, we've been raised that, uh, you know, the last thing we want to do is send money to the government. So we often structure our businesses so that from a tax standpoint, they show zero or very little profitability. And if we get to the end of the year and we've had a good year, the tax accountant might call and say, hey, you know, what do you want to do from, from a tax management standpoint? Do you want to go buy something for the farmer ranch, right? And there's always a never-ending list of things that we'd like to have, okay? So oftentimes we're making these decisions from a tax management standpoint, but but many of those things actually make the business less profitable, okay? So what, what we want to consider, what I want to challenge you to do, what we talk to many of our clients about doing is, if you're going to do something from a tax management standpoint, one test is let's make sure it makes the problem worse next year. Okay, so something that's going to generate more economic profitability, more return, more cash flow, so that next year your your tax problem is actually going to be worse. Okay, because tax problems really are good problems to have. So we, the last thing we want to do is manage our business from a tax avoidance standpoint. I mean, let's make our businesses wildly profitable and then let's worry about how to manage taxes, not the other way around. Don't manage taxes first because oftentimes it gets in the way of profitability. So we're looking for assets. We're looking for things that produce cash flow. And we're looking, uh, in in my opinion, hopefully to make tax problems worse the following year. Okay, so uh, so let's let's jump into this. I want to I want to give you guys an example uh, ranch that we can work from and and that we can discuss and 
and apply these some of these principles too. So, uh, so here's a letter uh, from an example ranch. They said, we ranch in an arid environment. Primary enterprises are commercial cow, calf, and seed stock. Now we feel like we've been progressive with the management of the, of the grazing on our ranch, but we just aren't seeing the results that we've expected. We've invested in water and fence, and we have the place split into 45 different grazing paddocks. But the condition of the pasture seems to stay the same, and we continue to battle undesirable plants every year. So this is a pretty good sized place. They've got 400 registered cows, or 400 registered cows calve in, in the first of February, March, and the 400 commercial cows start mid-March. So that we can identify sire groups, we break the registered cows into six different groups during breeding, and we run our commercial herd in two groups, and we have several other herds of yearling bulls, heifers, so on. All together, we've got about 12 bunches. We have three adult children who'd like to be part of the business, and we're eager to have them back, but that'll mean supporting six families on the ranch. My parents and my brother are also part of the business. Now, I've heard that with improved grazing management, we could increase utilization, increase the stocking rate. Our grazing development has slowed the decline in pasture condition, but we haven't been able to push stocking rate up much, if any. I've also heard that with some of these grazing programs, we can increase stocking rate in Individual animal performance suffers. Now, being in the seed stock business, animal performance is very important to us. So how can we increase utilization, maintain animal performance? Okay, so I'd, normally, oftentimes, if we had it to each other in person, I'd turn you guys loose in groups and, and we'd discuss this thing and tear it apart. But over Zoom, uh, that doesn't work very well. There, there's something I want you to look at, and I bet many of you already caught on to it. So I'm going to back up one slide. Okay, so how many actually pastures or paddocks do they have? Well, they've got 45, right? And then during that breeding season, which is oftentimes lined up with the growing season, how many groups of cattle do they have? Well, in this case, they're running, they're running 12. So how many pastures per herd do they effectively have? Okay. Just about four pastures per herd, if you do the math on that. Okay, so so really what they're doing is they're doing a four pasture rotation where they're just moving those animals around in a in a four pasture rotation. So so that's a really critical number is the number of pastures or paddocks per herd. It gives us an idea of how much control we have on that grazing management. Okay. Now, some of the things they describe going on here, right? They might have flatlined some decline in pasture condition, but they really aren't seeing that much improvement. And now those of you guys that are that do some of this grazing, is it any surprise? Okay, well, with only four pastures per herd, they they don't have, they're not getting much animal density. They're probably not getting their recovery periods right. Or if they are, their rest periods are probably not right, or their grace periods are probably not right. So there's a lot of things going on here. And we can we can talk about how to deal with this. Okay. 400 registered cows, 400 commercial cows. If you ask this family, which are your best cows, what do you think they'd say? Well, they'd probably say the registered cows are. Okay? This is an important point, okay? And I, I want to show you guys, it's oftentimes people that get excited about grazing management and about soil health get, and I, I get excited about those things, right? So I'm not, I'm not putting those things down, but, but there's a lot of emphasis on, we'll make the soil healthy, improve the grazing management to grow the business. Okay, to, to, to run more animals, right? to, to carry more head, um, or to reduce, uh, reduce fed feed. Okay? And I think all those things are great. But at some point before we start investing in fence and water and, and grazing infrastructure to grow that business, we need to ask, is this business any good? Okay? Do we, does this business, and when we say, is this business good? What we look at is, does this business have a strong gross margin? Right. What's the economic performance of this business? So, so let me show you the numbers on this example ranch that we're looking at. So here is a, just a really simple economic breakdown of this ranch. Let me walk you through this. They've got commercial cows. They've got registered cows. 400 commercial cows, 400 registered cows. Gross margin per cow. Now, I know some of you might not be real comfortable using that term or know what it understands. Think of it this way. The gross margin is... What's the value that this animal created minus the direct cost to carry this animal? How much is left over to service overheads? Okay. 
so the gross margin per cow that measures the economic efficiency of that enterprise gross margin per cow so let's look at that gross margin per cow on the commercial cows four hundred dollars what that means is the value this cow created minus her direct cost of running her there's four hundred dollars left over to service overheads the registered cows three hundred dollars do you think that surprised this ranch i i bet it did when they sat down and finished running these numbers now now how can that be if the registered cows are oftentimes they're producing more value right they're we're getting more for their for their calves or we're marketing their bulls in some way or marketing the replacement heifers right why would the commercial cows have a higher gross margin than the registered cows okay well in this ranch it's because the cost structure of raising those registered cattle Okay, now we talked in the thing that they're calving earlier. Maybe they're receiving more fed feed. Maybe they've got, you know, other expenses in breeding. You know, we don't know. We, we don't have all the numbers to break down. But we do know that those registered cows are less economically efficient than the commercial cows. So the main point I want to make here is when you get good at your grazing, when you build soil health, let's make sure we grow an enterprise that is economically strong. And many times we don't know which enterprises on our farms or ranches are economically strong. It's oftentimes it's not our favorite enterprise, right? I have a lot of people that say, well, I need to run more of my cows. My cows are good cows. We have really quality cattle, right? Quality cattle, good cattle are not necessarily economically efficient. Okay. So we need to be able to run those numbers and dive into those numbers and be able to let the numbers tell us which enterprise is our strong enterprise. Okay, so we can come back and have some discussion on that if you guys want to dive more into it. But the rest of this is simply just math. So we take the 400 commercial cows times the 400 gross margin per cow. Those commercial cows are producing 160,000 to service overheads. The registered cows, 120,000. We add those two numbers together. Total gross margin from the livestock is 280. And then the business overheads. Okay, so think of your business overheads. These are the cost of keeping the doors open on the ranch. So the biggest two categories are land and labor. So all your land costs go in the overheads and all the labor cost. And then also all the things that people use, things like machines, horses, right? All that stuff is a labor. So that all goes into the business overhead. So, so it takes $350,000 to keep the doors open on this ranch. We're generating $280,000 of margin. That means the business is making an economic loss of $70,000. Okay, so when this ranch finished running these numbers, they went, well, this isn't very good. No wonder we can't afford to bring the kids home. So now let's get to work at fixing it. Okay, so uh, when we start looking at fixing this thing, this is where we're going to transition to deploying capital in the business and looking for ways where some of that capital deployment can create a lot of value economically for the business. So uh, let's transition to looking at uh, the grazing principles that we teach at Ranching for Profit. So the principles that we teach, obviously we work in a really broad geographic area. The principles that, we've, that I've listed here are principles that work in any environment. Okay? It doesn't matter how much rainfall you get. It doesn't matter all those things. We, we Folks that live in a four inch, six inch precip zone versus people that live in a hundred inch precip zone. These principles work wherever you are. Okay, so principle number one, plan, monitor, manage. Obviously, making a plan before the grazing season begins, monitoring against that plan, and then making changes along the way. Principle number two, allow for appropriate recovery. Now, many times you hear people talk about rest, and sometimes I slip up and use the word rest too, but what we're really looking for is recovery on those plants. Okay, so are we, are we making sure those plants have the opportunity to recover before we're coming back in there again? Next principle is the shorter the graze period, the better. It's better for animal performance, better for soil, and better for plants. Okay, now we don't have a lot of time to dive into the nuances of these grazing principles. At least I haven't prepared that in my presentation today. So if you want to ask some questions on these, I'd be, I'd be happy to discuss them. But I'm just going to kind of roll through these, and then we're going to walk through an example. Principle number four, the higher the stock density, the better. Okay, stock density is the number of animals in a particular given unit. Okay, and from a from a ecosystem health standpoint, the higher the better. And principle number five is match supply and demand. 
Okay, that one seems pretty self-explanatory. So we're going to need to, uh, obviously the supply is going to vary year to year. So we're going to have to find a way to adjust our demand year to year, season to season. Okay. So let's apply some of these principles in an example. And we're going to, we're going to walk through this together. I mean, there's a, in this example, we've got a section of ground, 640 acres. And let's say for the, today's demonstration that, that, that um, traditional stocking rate in the area is 200 cows for 60 days. Okay, so it's it's pretty dang productive. This is this is pretty productive ground. Uh, at least for us in Wyoming, this would be extremely productive. Uh, for some of you guys, it, it might be more the norm. Uh, but uh, 640 acres, this ground will support 200 cows for 60 days. So in a traditional grazing type of program, right? Somebody might just throw those 60 cows or 200 cows out there, let them stay out there for for uh, two months, and come and collect at the end of that two months and and leave it at that. Okay. So if you and I took a ride through this pasture, if we came in the top corner up there and kind of zigzagged across and rode down by that water point and then left at the bottom corner, um, and let's assume there's not terrain that's pulling them to somewhere, there's a water point in the middle, um, but other than that, you know, they're just going to let their own grazing distribution happen. Okay, what would this pasture look like when we rode in that far back corner, when we started getting closer to the water, when we rode out of the water tank, and then when we rode out that far bottom corner? It's probably going to look something like this. We're around that water tank, and for a certain distance around it, it it's going to get pretty dang hammered. Right? And now maybe by next year when we're turning the cattle in, it would have had a long some time to recover. But over time, if we keep hammering those plants for 60 days at a time, we're going to overgraze those, right? They're going to be being rebitten while they're trying to grow, and they're going to start to go away. Weeds are going to come in. You guys all know the story on that. There'll be another circle that's a little bit wider where it's maybe it's a bit more moderate, right? Maybe there's some signs of plant spacing increasing, but maybe there's some pretty good areas in there as well. And then on that far outside, away from that water, there, there's going to be some undergrazing, right? Where maybe plants are getting too mature, too rank, where the animals don't want them anymore. Uh, in the drier environments, the spacing between the plants would actually start to increase. Okay, but again, land health would probably go down because of undergrazing. Okay, so so that's not a very good way to manage this pasture. Well, you guys all know that, right? You're on a call for for grazing management, so. So let's put some infrastructure development on this property so that we can better manage the grazing for it. Now, I'm just going to scratch this out here, not as a way to say this is the best way to develop a 640-acre grazing grazing plot. I don't know the best way, right? There's going to be a lot of things to depend on, but this would just be an example of one way to do it. So, so let's say this is a surface pipeline with a movable drinking tank, and we can put that in the four different positions. That are that are shown here, right? So we've got a uh, maybe a well with a pump in the center, and we've got a you know a quarter mile long um, surf pipeline that's going to sit on the surface, and we've got a drinker on the end of that that we're going to move around, and then maybe we're going to stretch out some some high tensile wire. If we're grazing cattle, maybe a single strand of high tensile wire uh, where these green lines are to to give us our you know we're splitting in quarters, and then if we if we really want to get crazy with it. Um, we can use that where that hot wire is brought out to grab some poly wire and stretch out some some individual grazing paddocks. Okay, so let's say this is the way I've developed it. Now again, I'm not suggesting this is the right way to do it. There's a million ways to do it. This will just give us some some discussion for for the rest of it. So so if we're grazing in this way now, so let's say we're we're going to put all those animals in there. We've stretched out our poly wire. We're going to give them three days of grass. Okay, and then when they've when they've used that we feel like it's time to move again we stretch out another poly wire um, move the animals into that so so there's their three days of grass now obviously we're going to be paying attention to animal performance animal condition um, how much forage are we leaving what's it look like where we're coming into right all those things principle number one plan monitor manage so let's say we're doing that and and we're making that work so i want you guys to think about what is that land going to look like after we graze this way for maybe two or three growing seasons, right? And now you and I do the exact same ride that we did before. We come in that that upper corner of the pasture, we ride across it, kind of zigging, zagging as we go down through, 
and we ride out that lower corner of the pasture, right? And we're looking down, maybe getting off and walking around and looking at some plants. I would suggest, and I think most of you that have been grazing for a while would agree, that this pasture is going to start to see some vast differences in terms of the ecological health that, that's going on in this. So some of the questions I'd have for you is, what are the annual recovery periods that, the, that this land is now getting? Okay, well, we went from having animals in that pasture from 60 days to having animals in those pastures for three days, right? And, and maybe it's productive enough, we're coming back again. So maybe it's getting two, gro two grazings. And for some of you, maybe even more than that during a growing season. Okay, so, but the recovery period as a whole has gotten a lot longer, right? We're, we're now we're getting our recovery periods closer to uh, what we consider appropriate. What about the graze period? Okay, the principle related to grace period was the shorter the better. Well, before we were in there for 60 days. So plants were getting regrazed, individual plants were getting regrazed, right? Um, all those things were happening. Uh, what about stock density? Okay, well, obviously in, in this example, we've got that stock density higher. So if stock density is a tool to build soil health and, uh, and to build succession um, or to jumpstart succession, then we're going to have that working for us. So what about cover? As, as we did our ride and, and look down on the ground, um, I would suggest, and I would hope most of you would agree, that the, the cover, the amount of ground that's covered by green growing desirable plants is going to be a lot higher. So that ground's going to be um, putting carbon into the soil, right? Building soil health. Plants are going to be more vigorous. Soil health is going to be coming along. The water cycle of that precip that we get, we're going to be able to use that in a more effective way. So we're going to start to see all these compounding effects that are working towards us and for, for us in a positive direction start to play out as we get the grazing right. So let's think about that now ecologically. For, uh, I'm sorry, economically, from an economic perspective. And I'm going to I know it's always dangerous to run numbers, especially at this time of night, but uh, bear with me. I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. Now, I'm going to I'm going to give some guesses as to what I think this development might cost. You might think I'm off. The cost in your area might be way different. Um, this is what we'd pay in our area for some of this stuff. So if I'm going to buy a quarter mile of, a, of an inch and a quarter, inch and a half um, HDPE pipe and put a drinker on it, I think I might pay somewhere around $2,500 for that. If I was going to put in the, those high tensile fences, that's probably about three miles of single strand high tensile fence on maybe one inch, uh, inch and a quarter fiberglass posts spaced 75 feet apart. I think I might have about $3,500 in, in putting that fence in. I need about three rolls of poly wire, so maybe another 500 bucks for that. So my grazing infrastructure costs $6,500, okay? So that, that's just a quick budget for me. Again, maybe your numbers are different. So before I put the changes into place, this pasture was running 200 cows for 60 days. Okay. Now, I think a good number to use that's a pretty broad number across a lot of the country that we work with is, is a, let's assume a cow day is worth $1.50. Okay, so if I was going to graze your cows for you, you'd pay me about a buck and a half a day to graze your cows. That would be the value of that grass. Okay, so 200 cows times 60 days is 12,000 cow days. If a cow day is worth a buck and a half, then the forage in that pasture before we made the changes was worth 18,000 bucks. So now let's make the changes. Oh, okay, harvest efficiency. Drop my pen. This is a this is a number that can be a little bit hard to wrap wrap your head around. So I'm going to try to do a, a decent job explaining it. Um, this comes uh, this is discussed pretty well in Jim Garrett's Kick the Hay Habit book. So if you haven't read that book yet, I'd suggest you get it. Uh, there's a version of this chart in that book, and we've expanded a little bit here. So harvest efficiency is the percent of the total annual forage production that ends up in the belly of a grazing animal. Okay, so let's say an acre of ground grows 4,000 pounds of forage a year. Okay, so two tons of forage, 4,000 pounds. Let's say you come by and you graze that in two or three grazing rotations through the year. Okay, now each grazing rotation, you might take 10 or 20%, right? Coming in here, eating it here, coming in here, eating it here. That's not what this percent is talking about. This isn't, this isn't utilization percent. 
this is the percent of the total annual production that ends up in the belly. Okay, so of that 4,000 pounds or two tons, what percent at, after all the grazings are done, do we actually get in the belly of a grazing animal? So on this chart down here, as you look at this, you see that graze period, the length of the graze period is correlated pretty linearly with harvest efficiency. Okay, now I'll back up from these numbers a little bit. These are not research determined, you know, peer reviewed studied numbers. They're numbers based on experience and, and time, right? So let's look at native range. Okay, so this is to kind of be our area around Wyoming, native range, you know, 13 inches of precip a year. If a graze period is 30 days or longer, we're going to plan on about 25% harvest efficiency. Meaning if I've got rangeland pasture that grows 1,000 pounds per acre, I'm going to plan 250 pounds per acre in the belly of a grazing animal. Okay, and that might be a, the stocking rate I plan for. As I shorten my grazing period, I'm going to be able to pick up a little more of, of that feed. Okay, and it, it's simply as, as thinking about that pasture that we had there. When we turned the 60 cows in there, or the 200 cows for 60 days, they didn't cover that pasture very well, right? There was a lot of overgrazed, undergrazed stuff, right? A lot of that feed was probably fouled and trampled. When we said to those animals, okay, here's your feed for this shorter period of time, then they're going to be use it more uniformly, okay? So well, that's part of what's going on here. As we shorten that grace period, so let's shorten it all the way down to one day in native range, okay? This probably wouldn't make sense in most environments, but let's say we did. Shorten it all the way down to one day grace period. Our total percent of the annual growth could go up to as much as 50%, right? So that's a doubling of the number of cow days that I'm getting off of that native range. Went from 25% to 50%, okay? As we look at different types of ground, uh, irrigated ground or, or high precipitation zones, um, we can push those numbers quite a bit more. Uh, what many of our folks call improved ground, right? This would kind of be moderate productivity ground. Uh, those numbers fall off a little bit. So in the example that we're looking at, I'm gonna use the numbers of Let's see, we'll, we'll call this improved ground or more moderate per productivity ground. Example number one, it was those 200 cows in there for 60 days. So we're going to use a harvest efficiency of, it's more than 30 days in the grace period. So a harvest efficiency of 40 day, 40%. And then when we put in our grazing development, let's say we went to a three-day grace period where we were you know, grazing the animals for three days on, on average. Now, it doesn't mean every graze period has to be three days, right? But on, on average, we were moving to about that. So we would move to a 60% harvest efficiency. Okay. And the reason I use this chart is when we look at grazing development, this chart gives us a good idea of numbers to use for rough math. For if I put this grazing system in, what might I expect after a year or two? for increases in carrying capacity, okay? I find that this chart does a pretty good job getting me in the ballpark, okay? So let's take our 40% and our 60%. If we look at those two numbers, right, it's a little bit deceiving because it went from 40% in the belly to 60% in the belly. But if you step back and think about it, moving from 40% to 60% really constitutes a 50% improvement in the amount of the feed that we're that's ending up in the belly of the grazing animal. Okay, so 50% improvement, let's use that to, to do some budgeting from. There's our, there's our pasture. That's what the forage was worth before we put the improvements in. Forage was worth 18,000 bucks. Let's put the improvements in. We had our 12,000 cow days. If we're estimating by putting in all those improvements, we might get a 50% improvement in our carrying capacity. Then that's 18,000 cow days. If a cow day is still worth $1.50 a day, then that's then the forage is now worth $27,000, or that's a $9,000 improvement in the, in the forage value of that 640 acres. Okay. So if we looked at investment, we invested 9,000 bucks. Now, sure, it's gonna take some time, it's gonna take some management, it's gonna take some skills, but if we're just looking at cash out of pocket, Okay, 9,000 bucks went out of our pocket. I'm sorry, $9,000 improvement. Our, our Im improvements cost, the fencing and water cost $6,500. Okay, 
that was our investment. That if we that's a hundred percent return on investment in that time period. Okay, so I mean, many times when people are looking at, oh, hey, what could I spend money on and get a return? If people can talk themselves into a ten or fifteen percent return on investment, oftentimes they do it. Well, here's an instance where a six thousand five hundred dollar infrastructure project put nine thousand dollars of additional fridge value or a hundred percent return on investment, 150% return on investment. So I think that's that's pretty good stuff. So so let's go back. I'm just about ready to wrap up here and take questions. So let's go back and look at the look at our example. There's our letter. We had 400 commercial cows, 400 registered cows. I'm guessing many of you are, are probably uh, uh, harsh people and said, well, if those registered cows aren't aren't cutting the mustard, let's get rid of them. Okay, so so let's assume we did that. If we took the grass from those registered cows, put a commercial cow out there that's making $400 a gross margin, then that number becomes 800. 800 times the $400 gross margin now gives us $320,000 of gross margin. We've only got one enterprise. So there's our total gross margin is 320, but our overhead stayed at 350,000. So we're still making an economic loss of $30,000. Well, what if we took these grazing principles we just talked about? How could we put more animals in one herd, lengthen the recovery period, shorten the graze period? Might we be able to, through good management, run more animals with those same amount of overheads? Let's say we could have, excuse me, this ranch have the same improvement the example ranch just had, 50% improvement in carrying capacity. That would mean on the same amount of land, we're able to run 1,200 cows. Obviously, it's not going to happen every year or in drought years or all those things. If their gross margin is still $400, now we've got a total enterprise gross margin of 480000 Total gross margin of four hundred eighty on the $350,000 of overheads gives us an economic profit of one hundred and thirty. So that's moving from an economic loss of 70000 to an economic profit of 130, a difference of $200,000 there. So that's pretty dang good. And another thing to look at is, is this ranch simpler to run than the previous one? I think it is, okay. So balanced use of profit to meet owner objectives. Let's invest in things that will give you a tax problem in the future, okay? Let's not eliminate taxes, but maybe we could reduce them, but let's invest in things that are gonna produce make that problem worse in the future. There's a whole list of things that we often see are good places, oftentimes good places to deploy capital uh, that, that can be those things. So water and fence went through that, livestock scales for marketing, uh, buying livestock with a high gross margin, invest in yourself and knowledge for key people, stockmanship skills, marketing skills, offer investments, having to, the small inventory of dependable equipment that's there and it works when you need it safe, effective facilities, operating on cash and knocking out the operating node, family vacations to refresh people, to re-intercharge them, to get them charged up about their work, right? So those are all things that we see are oftentimes good uses of profit. So so I'll wrap up here. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways you guys can stay in touch with us. I hope you've enjoyed this and and uh, I want to stay in touch with us. All these things are are free or low cost. Profit tips is, is an email we send out twice a month. Uh, you just go on our website and, and sign up for that. Our website is ranch management or ranchingforprofit.com. Um, RFP First Steps is, is, again, an online thing you subscribe to. Look at our social media stuff. Go on our YouTube channel. We do have a couple of books on our website. You're welcome to order those. Um, the Turnaround is the newest one. Uh, another one is The Healthy Lands, Happy Families, Profitable Businesses. If you haven't taken Ranching for Profit, we'd love to have you come. Or if it's time to repeat, we'd love to have you do that. And then, of course, we have our executive link program. So uh, there's the books. And here is a schedule of our upcoming schools. And uh, yeah, so with that, I'm going to stop talking and let's take some questions. So thank you so much, Dallas. So the first one that I have for you is when you were talking about calculating business overhead, you mentioned that labor expenses should be included in that number. Now, I know a lot of the farmers on this call, they're either sole proprietors or they're partners. So legally, they don't pay themselves a wage. Should they be leaving that wage out of their overhead calculation or should they put in a number that would be 
the value of how much they'd have to pay someone else to do the job they do. What are your, what are your thoughts on calculating labor into overhead? Yeah, great, great question. So the answer is the latter. You, you would budget in what it would cost to replace yourself for the work that you're doing in the business. Okay, so if I had to hire somebody to do that. Now, that doesn't mean that I necessarily have to write a check for that, right? Um, I, I think it's actually a good idea to write a check for that, right? Your business pays you for the work that you're doing. You live your life out of that money, right? Um, but there's some sometimes tax reasons, financial reasons why it doesn't make sense to do that. Um, when you're doing your economic projections, your economic numbers, which is what we're talking about here, um, you know, we're going to budget that in there. I do the same thing for my company, right? My company, I'm going to budget it in. What does it cost to replace the work that I'm doing? And that's the number that's going to live in there. So, so yeah, absolutely. They need to include a uh, wage for the work that they're doing. If you don't do that, then you really, you don't have a, you don't have an idea of how profitable your business is, right? What, what you're, if like if you left your wage out, then what you're going to, what you're going to find out is, well, look how profitable my farm is when I subsidize free labor, right? That that's all you're finding. So you're really just kidding yourself. Yeah. So you, you have to include it. Thanks. That, that's helpful for getting started on those calculations. Um, I've got, <laughs> you've definitely got people fired up. Uh, I've got two extremely oh, <laughs> similar questions in the chat. Um, how many Canadian schools have you run in the past or how many are you planning to do in the near future? And related to that is, are you planning to run any schools in the eastern part of, of Canada uh, or in Manitoba? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, we're, it's been hard to get back into Canada, and um, I'm excited now that we've been doing it. Um, we've just finished our um, our second school near Calgary. Uh, we did one two years ago. We did another one this year, and we just did a school in Saskatoon uh, that we plan to repeat. Uh, so, so our plan next year is to off, also offer those two schools in Canada, uh, the one just south of Calgary, uh, Okotoks. And then the one in, in Saskatoon, uh, we do not have any plans to add schools, uh, more schools in Canada further to the east. Um, so uh, what I oftentimes tell people, because we get this question in the States too, right? Everywhere we go, people are like, hey, when are you going to come do a school near me? Uh, my response is we're not. Get over it. Get on a plane. <laughs> so uh, really, I in in all seriousness, you will have a better experience at Ranching for Profit if the school is a long ways away from your farm or ranch. Okay, you, the, the people who tend to have the worst experiences are the people that go to a school right near where they farm or ranch. Okay, because the other people in the class, farm and ranch in the same environment you do, they have the same challenges. They're not, the questions they're asking each other, the things they're challenging with are oftentimes not very big questions. They're more technical in nature, right? Rather than strategic. And, and then also the things you want to be able to discuss at Ranching for Profit are not things you want to talk about with a bunch of people that you farm and ranch in the same community with, right? You want to be able to talk about succession stuff. You want to be able to talk about, right, managing your difficult father-in-law or whatever that might be, right? And it's really hard to talk about those things when you're there. And then thirdly, if you're 60 minutes away from home, you're going to be tempted to go home at night. Right. And that's the last thing you want to do when you're ranching for profit. Right. You want to stay there. You want to network with people in the evening, um, not trying to run home and feed cows before you come to class in the morning. That would be a complete waste of time. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So long story short, build the networks far from home so that you can be completely honest and no one at home knows what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's a little not quite what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> no that um uh, that's great but no we're excited that there are some schools in canada um they're not specifically close to us in ontario but it is exciting that that there are some opportunities i, I see a the name up there well. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna call him out and put him on the spot josh lucas um you went thousands of miles from home to go to ranching for profit would you i don't know maybe you're maybe he turned mute would you share uh yeah can you hear me Yes, we can. Hey, how you doing, Dallas? Good, man. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Um, yeah, so I actually I took ranching for profit close to home, but then I went far away for the executive link program, and it was the I went as far away as I could, 
because I knew I needed to talk to somebody who knew nothing about my business and nothing about my environment. Um, it was the best decision I made was getting on a plane to go. Absolutely. It actually took away from when I took the Rancher for Profit class close to home. I knew people in the room, like a lot of people, and it actually took away from the experience a lot, like you said. Well, thanks for sharing that, man. Yeah. Thanks. So, Dallas, as I guess part of the takeaway for people tonight who've heard sort of the, the short snippet, that, that kind of hard hitting overview of, of the kinds of things you talk about, if um, maybe getting on a plane is not in the budget right now, uh, but they want to start crunching some numbers. Where would you suggest they start, or or um, which which farm advisor should they be talking to? What what's something simple that people can get going on with looking at those enterprises on their operation? Sure. Yeah. Um, so that book I shared, Turnaround. Um, that's actually what we send to people when they enroll in Ranching for Profit, and it walks through the economic planning process and in a fairly step-by-step -step way it includes a lot of the uh, uh, kind of draft versions of a lot of the forms that we use in class to walk through your economics so you know picking up that book reading it kind of understanding the principles of the way we do it um it it's one of those things where do learning how to get good at running your numbers takes several iterations it's not something where the first time you sit down to do it you're going to feel really strong really skilled at doing it right um a, a nice Corollary is um, who learned how to swim by reading a book about swimming, right? Nobody did. Eventually, you got to get in the pool. And it's the same thing with running your economics. The, the best way to learn how to do it is to get some resources, set them down, pull out some blank pieces of paper at the, at the table, and just start bashing your way through it. Uh, you, everybody's going to run into questions about, okay, what do I do with this number, right? Where does that go? Should I how complicated should I get with my enterprise mix, right? Should I break out my heifers from my cows? Should I break out each crop as a thing? And and I, that book will be some good guide guidelines about how to walk through it and how to look at it at a fairly high high level. And then we've got a lot of YouTube videos as well that, that people can kind of get, get the taste for it um, and start learning that. And it does help when people come to school after having done a bit of that work on their own, right? They're they're at a more they're able to get, grasp more of it when they come to school with that background. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat, so uh, with that, I'm going to pass things over to Birgit Martin for some final comments. So, just to wrap up the evening, uh, thank you, Dallas. It was outstanding. I think very thought provoking for um, all of us, I'm sure, and uh, some hard questions for us all uh, to look at because I don't think we as farmers tend to look at these questions and answer them honestly. So I think this has been really, really good. And once again, thank you to our sponsors, the Beef Farmers of Ontario and the Farm Resilience Mentorship Program. With that, thanks again, everyone. Thank you for participating. This is our last webinar for Profitable Pastures 2024. Um, and with that, uh, thank you very much and have a good evening. <laughs>